So we're looking at the feasts of Israel and how they foreshadow Jesus Christ, how they speak of the Messiah ahead of time in a sort of calendrical prophecy. There's, it's like a prophecy embedded in the calendar of Israel. We already talked about four of the feasts, or three depending on how you count them. Um, we talked about Passover, unleavened bread, we talked about first fruits, and then we also talked about the Feast of Pentecost, which is also a first fruits-ish type feast, although one's like barley harvest and the wheat harvest. So um, now we're dealing with the fall feasts of Israel. So today we're going to talk about three specific feasts. I'll explain what they are and then how in some ways they're typological of Christ. And then we'll do, if I have time, I'll do a little bit of the debate on eschatology. That is like, oh, is that the rapture? Is that the second coming? Is that this? I'll do a little bit of that, but I'm, I'm not going to focus on that because the focus here is the foreshadowings of Jesus. And I have a theory that we're not going to really know what these are going to be until they happen. Um, so we'll, then we'll see. Um, so the, the, the feasts in order are uh, the Feast of Trumpets, also called Rosh Hashanah. And that's this year starting September 30th. Um, the Day of Atonement called Yom Kippur. Day, Yom Kippur, Atone. Um, so Yom Kippur, and that's October 9th and 10th. And then the, tab the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And this is where they actually go into tents for a week. And it's also called Sukkot, the, the Feast of Sukkot. And then this is um, October 14th through 20th. That's just for this year, 2019. It's different every year because they're operating, operating a lunar calendar, not the same calendar that we're using. So first, we'll look at uh, the feasts to comprehend what they were like. And then if there's time again, at the end, I'll give some, some eschatological conjecture about those, th those types of things. I'm not going to pick a side because... Because I don't know. Um, so Leviticus 23, this is, this is where we're going to start off. Leviticus 23, verse 23, we get into the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. And so we read here, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, that for them is the month of Tishri, it's the seventh month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest. A memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. That's all the info you're going to get right there. The Feast of Trumpets, in fact, is probably of these feasts, the, ones, the one that has the least data, the least amount of information on exactly what was to be done. Um, but it's on a special day, as they all are. There's a holy convoc convocation or a gathering of the people, as they all have. There's a day of rest. Proclaim. So it's like a special Sabbath. Uh, you might even call it a Sabbath, but it wasn't necessarily on Saturday. It could have been on just whatever, whatever day that fell on in the uh, seventh month on the first day of the month. And some specific sacrifices are given. Now, more detail is given in Numbers 29. So we're going to look at Numbers 29 now, and we're going to understand this Feast of Trumpets a little better. And uh, 20, Numbers 29 verse 1 is where, where we're going to start here. It says, on the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. So again, same day, first day, seventh month. You shall not do any ordinary work. It's a day for you to blow the trumpets. Hence the name, the Feast of Trumpets, right? It's a day to blow trumpets. And you shall offer a burnt offering for a pleasing aroma to the Lord, one bull from the herd, one ram, seven male lambs, a year old without blemish. That's the burnt offering. Also their grain offering. Remember, the, we went over the offerings the, the burnt offering is a specific kind. We talked, talked about the typology of that. The grain offering is another kind. Um, it's going to be of fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for the bull, two-tenths for the ram, and one-tenth for each of the seven lambs. When we did the grain offering, remember, we talked about how the grain offering was generally part of another offering. It was just added in to, in this case, the burnt offering. So you have a certain amount of this grain for each of these animals. Verse 5, with one male goat for a sin offering. Sin offerings are like for corporate sin issues in Israel. Um, to make atonement for you besides the burnt offering of the new moon and its grain offering and the regular burnt offering and its grain offering and their drink offering according to the rule for them for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. So there's a new moon offering. There's like morning and evening offerings. You're going to keep doing those on this day. There's an additional Feast of Trumpets offering though. So it's all outlined. But the unique element, <clears throat> the thing that makes the Feast of Trumpets different than the other feasts, and that's one way to kind of highlight these feasts, is the trumpets. 
It's the trumpets. The trumpets we read about also in Numbers 10, when God actually tells them to, to fashion special trumpets that are going to be used for their feasts. Generally, at this point, I see someone pull out a shofar, which I don't have. I don't have a shofar. Um, but the shofar is like a horn, the horn of an animal. And this was used. They would blow the shofar, or the, the animal's horn. They would just hollow these out, and they're natural trumpets. They're kind of homegrown, you know, on, on your dog or whatever animal you have that's growing horns. <clears throat> and so you blow this to, to make announcements. But it turns out, in Israel, there were also two other special manufactured trumpets that didn't come from animals, and that's Numbers 10. So Numbers 10, verses 1 and 2, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. Remember they're in tents, and there's times where they have to gather together either for a feast or they gather together to like break camp, to go to war. So depending on what they were, in fact, Numbers 10 goes on and it gives a list. It's like, blow the trumpets this way if you have to go to war. Blow them this way if you just want to bring the people together. Blow these trumpets. But these silver trumpets were like different than a normal shofar. Numbers 10.10 connects this to what we're talking about today. It says, on the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. They shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord, your God. So, in presentations I've seen, where people talk about the Feast of Trumpets involving these shofars, I think the biblical representation is the Feast of Trumpets involves these silver trumpets. That's what we get in Numbers 10. And in Numbers 10.10, 10, it talks about how you're going to use these specifically on the days of feasting. These trumpets, these silver trumpets. Doesn't mean no other trumpets were blown that day. Doesn't mean nothing else could have happened. But these were definitely involved and they were highlighted. And they were meant to be a memorial. In fact, that's what we got also in Leviticus. So in Numbers 10.10, 10, these trumpets are a memorial for them before God. And then in Leviticus 23.24... When we read about the Feast of Trumpets, it says that these, this feasting day and the trumpets are a memorial also. It's a, mo a memorial proclaimed, quote. So the question is, who's being remembered and who's remembering? That's the question I have. And as I try to look at it and look for hints in the text, as I'm just reading through the text, I'm going, okay, is, is this to say, God, remember us as we blow these trumpets? It's like, God, you're remembering us. Or is it, hey, Israel, bah, 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 remember God? Which one's being said here? Well, in Numbers 10.10, 10, the, the verse I just read, it says, they shall be a reminder of you before your God. So the implication is it's to get God to remember Israel. Now we know that when God remembers Israel, this is talking about him turning in positive attitudes and actions towards Israel. It's not like he's going, oh yeah, there's that nation I called a while back. You know, it's not like that kind of remembering. But it's, it's like God turn to us, help us, remember us now. That's the idea. Exodus 28.12 supports this. It says, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Remember we talked about this. This is the, um, the, the high priest garments. As stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. So it's the idea is that God is remembering Israel. It's pictured. It's representative. This, this person's standing here to cause God to turn towards Israel in a positive fashion. So I think it's safe to say that these trumpets are causing God to remember Israel. It's, God, it's Israel calling out to God. God, re remember us. Turn to us. We're calling for your help. We're calling for your aid. We're calling for your attention. But something Pastor Gary has taught me over the years is just because it's one doesn't mean it's not the other. So these trumpets are to be reminding us of things. Well, it's also possible that this is to, remember, to remind the people of Israel of God that it's working both ways. See, these trumpets aren't just blown in God's presence. They're blown in the presence of the people. So they may be calling the people to turn to God and calling God to turn to the people, meaning that the Feast of Trumpets becomes a time to refocus on God, to turn your hearts and your minds towards God as God turns towards you. And we get this in Exodus 12, 14. It says that Passover was a memorial also, another feast day that's also a memorial, but it's not a memorial to God. It's a memorial to the people of Israel. That's interesting. It's to cause them to remember. So I'm, I'm thinking there's a possibility here that, God, that it's both, that it's not an either or thing, it's a both thing, that, that the remembrance is for both. Nowadays, the Feast of Trumpets is seen as the beginning of, it's, not, it's a joyous time, it's considered a happy time, but it's also seen as the beginning of a time of repentance in Israel. So when they blow the trumpets, and they blow them all day long, lots of times during the day they're blowing the trumpets, and they're saying, hey, it's time to repent and turn to God. Um, in fact, 
Moses Maimonides, um, who also called Rambam, who is one of the most famous commentators on the on the Torah that's ever ever lived. He's from the 12th century, uh, you know, 12th century AD. He wrote the following about the Feast of Trumpets. Listen to what he says to his his people Israel. He says, "Wake up from your sleep, you sleepers." Arise from your slumber, you slumberers. Examine your deeds. Return to God. Remember your creator. Those of you who forget the truth in the futilities of the times and spend all year in vanities and emptiness, look into your soul. Improve your ways and your deeds. Let each of you abandon his evil ways and his immoral thoughts. And so nowadays this is kind of seen as like a uh, a call to repentance, like Israel come back to God. Israel come back to God. That's the idea behind the Feast of Trumpets now. It's the beginning of a season of turning back to God. But the only example in the Bible we have of the Feast of Trumpets being observed, where they talk about their attitude during it, it's in Nehemiah chapter 7. And um, I have too much tonight to study through it, but it's it's Nehemiah 7 verse 73 through chapter 8 verse 12. You could reference it on your own. But here's the idea. He tells them they're repenting because Ezra is reading the law and they're realizing how much they've fallen short of what God's told them to do. And they're repenting. And Nehemiah or excuse me, Ezra stands up and he tells the people, stop, don't, don't do this. Don't be crying and weeping today. They do it later on, but not right now because today is a day of rejoicing. Today is a day of celebrating because it's kind of like the focusing and turning of their hearts to God is a time of celebration, not just mourning. So that's interesting. Um, it doesn't give us a whole lot more information on that. Um, for the Feast of Trumpets, there's blowing of trumpets. There's a reminder before Israel to turn to God and for God to turn to Israel. And it's the day of the new year. There's two different New Year's days in, in, in the Bible for the, Jew, for the Jewish people, right? There's the Passover as they begin that, that month, the first day of that month, the Passover is on the 14th, but the first day of that month, that's, that's a new year for them. But then there's another new year that happens. There's two different new years. One's considered religious, one's considered civil. So at the blowing of these trumpets, it begins the new civil year, which is why Rambam told them, you who spend all year in waste and futility, he goes, now turn to God. It's, it's like what we do when we, when we bring ourselves to the new year. I often do this. When January 1st rolls around, I'm thinking about my life. I'm thinking about the last year. I'm like, what have I been doing? Am I wasting my time? Am I on target? Am I off target? And I start to kind of refocus, you know, join a gym, don't go. Do things like this. I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't join gyms. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, so it's also the new year. So keep that in mind. But now let's look at the second feast, which is the Day of Atonement. And this one, we have a lot of information. It's like the opposite of the Trump, the Feast of Trumpets. We have tons of da- data on this. And I won't be able to get into all of it. Um, but the big picture of the Day of Atonement, it happens 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets. The big picture is it's the one day, the one day when all of the sins of Israel, the whole nation, are dealt with corporately. And it's the one day when the high priest goes inside the Holy of Holies. So this is a big, big deal. This is a big deal. We read about it in Numbers 29. Numbers 29, verses 7 through 11. Remember the seventh month. So we're still in that same month, Tishri. And it says, on the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation and afflict yourselves. Afflict yourselves. You shall do no work, but you shall offer a burnt offering to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, one bull from the herd, one ram, seven lambs a year old. See that they are without blemish. Because the overarching symbolism of these offerings is that they are um, a pure a pure thing being offered in substitute of our impure persons, right? That's it's pure, the pure for the impure. And of course, that points to Jesus. Verse 9, and their grain offering shall be a fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for the bull, two-tenths for one ram, a tenth for each of the seven lambs. Um, also, one male goat for a sin offering beside the sin offering of atonement and the regular burnt offering and its grain offering and their drink offering. So there's a lot of offerings going on. We're not going to get into all those. We covered the typology of the offerings in detail previously. Here's the unique thing about the Day of Atonement. It was in that first verse, you shall afflict yourselves. Numbers 29.7, you shall afflict yourselves. Afflict yourselves, it has the, the connotation of being humble and being brought low. There's even Jewish traditions where they wouldn't even wear shoes on this day. Tradition, not scripture, it's just tradition. But they wouldn't even wear shoes because it was like a way of saying, I'm low, I'm humbled before you, God. So the Day of Atonement is a time where Israel is not being asked to be in this great state of rejoicing. They're being asked to be humble. It's generally interpreted by Jewish interpreters as, to, as fasting. Throughout time, they've referred to this affliction as fasting. So they eat nothing on this day. I'm not going to eat anything. It's a day of fasting. 
and it's seen in even modern Israel as a time of repentance. So they see the Feast of Trumpets as kind of like an announcement that the Day of Atonement is coming. And then as they're leading up to the Day of Atonement, this time of affliction and humility, where all the sins of Israel are dealt with, they're in repentance, they're looking over their lives, they're reconsidering their ways, and they're humbling themselves, even afflicting themselves. Not like you're beating yourself necessarily, That's, it's not something crude like that, but it's this idea of being brought low. It's like a broken and contrite heart, that's the idea. We get more information in Leviticus 23. So turn Leviticus 23, verse 26, we'll get more details about this Day of Atonement. So we're looking at numbers, Leviticus trying to gather the data. It says in verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord, and you shall not do any work on that day, on that very day, for it is a day of of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever's not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. Big deal, right? You're going to be banished from Israel. You're going to be cut off from your people if you do not humble yourselves and obey this day of atonement thing. I think that when there's these big issues, it's kind of like the gathering of the sticks on the Sabbath. It's like this points directly to Christ. There's a humble submission to the sacrifice of Jesus. Verse 30, and whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever through, throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. I think that this idea of them not being able to work, he says it like three times in a row. You can't work. Again, Christ does the work. We're saved by grace through faith, right? And it's, that is the gift of God, not of ourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So there's no work that I do. I simply trust in Christ. I'm saved. This is really good news for me, by the way, because there's no work that I could do to, to commend myself to God. I just humble myself. He does the work. What's interesting is that in modern Israel, in the Day of Atonement, because they no longer have the high priest, they no longer have these sacrifices and offerings, what they tell the people to do, the rabbis, they've reinterpreted, the, the, they've kind of made a new Judaism, not new to me and you, but new, certainly would be new to the, to the Jews of the time of Moses, this, this rabbinic Judaism, it's reinterpreting the, the laws of Israel. And they say, what you will do leading up to the Day of Atonement is lots of works, good works. You will be a good person. You will, you will do good deeds. You will repent of the bad deeds, and you will commend yourself to God through your godliness, through your good works. So it, that's the reinterpretation. That's the current modern rabbinical Judaism view. Verse 32 here, it says, It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening. From evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. Remember, their days start in the evening and go until the following evening. That's just their, that's when their days begin, not at midnight. So trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, is about blowing trumpets, and it's an announcement, and it's saying, like, God, remember Israel. Israel, remember God. And it announces the new year. The Day of Atonement is about atonement. It's about the forgiveness of sins, being brought back together with God. Some people say you can remember the meaning of atonement by separating the words out at one Meant, I don't know, meant, I don't know what you do with that word, but, <laughs> but the idea is that you are being put into unity, that you're connected, you're reconnected with God, you're atoned. Um, that's the idea of atonement. And the way this happens on your part, you're humble and you do no work. And then there's a sacrifice that has to be made, this incredible sacrifice. I mean, this is not, I mean, it's just not clear that this is, this is ultimately pointing to the gospel of Christ. So that's what the congregation did. They simply yielded themselves in humility and repentance of over any sin issues, and they just trusted in God. But what the high priest did is what I'm most interested in. Because on the Day of Atonement, the high priest did some really special things. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 16. Remember Leviticus, the book that's pertaining to the Levites. And in chapter 16, we get a lot of detail about what the high priest did. So we're going to be reading a big chunk of that. So Leviticus 16.1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they drew near before the Lord and died, let me remind you in case you didn't know, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they came in when, when, when God's glory fought, fell and they were like all excited and they ran right into the temple without God's permission and not in God's ways. And so God struck them dead. They brought strange fire before the Lord. You see, you can only come before God one time and only with his permission and in some special sense. Only if the high priest is properly representing Christ can he come, and because he's kind of being covered by Christ as well. But they ran in, and they did not do that. And they may have been drunk as well, because he also warns them 
and don't be drinking when you're, when you're coming into my presence. So he, they may be related as well. But verse 2, he tells them when he can come. They went when they couldn't. He says when they can. Verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. See, access to God is only sort of available in the temple. It's not fully available like it is through Christ. Because when he came, he died and then the veil tore open saying that the way has been made. Verse 3, but in this way... Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. These are going to be for his own sin. As we read on, we'll realize this. The bull and the ram are for his own sin. Um, Hebrews 9 talks about this, and it says that, I'll just read it to you, 9.6, reading on through verse 14, it says, These preparations having thus been made about the temple, the, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. That's the holy place they go into. But into the second, the, high, the, the holy of holies, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. You know why the temple was in two sections, the tabernacle? To say that, hey, there isn't even full access. There's layers and there's boundaries, um, and it's not yet there. Hebrews 7 adds to this, Hebrews 7, verse 26 through 28. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself, For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who's been made perfect forever. And so this day of atonement is about like an ultimate sacrifice that is meant to cover like this, the people of Israel for like a year, so to speak. Well, Jesus, he takes that to the next level. He's the ultimate sacrifice once for all time, never to be repeated. So back to Leviticus 16 and verse four, the description of what the priest does that day. It says, he shall put on the holy linen coat. We, we, we talked about the details of that recently. And shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. So he's, he's dressed completely in white now to represent purity. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And it's like now he can represent Jesus. Now it's not just Aaron coming. He's coming as though he were Christ so he can stand before God. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. See, the previous animals were for his sin, right? These ones are for the sin of the people. It's two goats and a ram. The goats are for a sin offering. That covers the sins corporately of the people. The ram is for a burnt offering. It's like saying, we're offered to you. We, we're, uh, we're fully given over to you, Lord. That's kind of the idea there. Verse 6, um, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself. That's the previous bull we read about in verse 3. And shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Um, now, what happens next is, is the interesting part. It's the scapegoat. We're all familiar with the term scapegoat. It actually comes from scripture. It's an English translation of a, of a term we'll get into in a second. Um, this is the interesting part about the Day of Atonement. This is a really unique part. I already talked when I talked about the high priest garments, about the significance of him like taking off his glory. He comes only in white that day. He looks like a normal guy, just, just a pure guy. I talk, we talked about all that kind of stuff already. So we're going to talk about the scapegoat. The first thing you'll notice, though, is about these goats. The offerings on the Day of Atonement, according to verse 5, had to be taken, quote, from the congregation of the people. Aaron had to take something to offer for his own sins, right? But this, the thing that would cover this into the people had to be taken from the people. That's interesting. He couldn't provide it. They had to give, they had to give it. And it, it's, it's because it's representative, but also there may be a connection here to the fact that Jesus comes from the congregation of the people. And then he, he's, he's, he comes in human form. He lives in and amongst us. And he comes as, as an Israeli, as a Jewish man. And then he comes from the congregation. And he stands there on their behalf. Very interesting. Verse 7, now we get into the goats. He shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Now some, some translations will say scapegoat and some will say to Azazel or for Azazel. 
Um, the word Azazel is the word they're translating scapegoat. If they leave it untranslated, it's just Azazel. There's a debate on this word. It would take longer than all of today to talk about the whole debate. So let me just say this. Um, Az means goat. Azel means to send out or to turn off. And so that's where we get the idea of the scapegoat, the goat that is sent away. And there's some who think Azazel is like a, like a name, and this comes from the Book of Enoch and yada, yada, yada. I personally don't buy into that, so I'm not going to get into it. Um, but I'll just refer to it as this, this, the, the goat for Azazel is a reference to the scapegoat, in my opinion. Um, okay, verse 9. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel, or the scapegoat, shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel, or to be the scapegoat. So, casting lots. This is interesting. He actually cast lots. It doesn't say he used the Urim and Thummim for this, whatever those were. It says he cast lots. Now, for those who think the Urim and Thummim were actually just dice or something along those lines, that seems to conflict with this. Why would he be casting lots? Why wouldn't it say he used the Urim and Thummim? Anyway, so he, he cast lots. And so it's random. He rolls dice or some, some equivalent of that. Maybe there's debate over what they were like. We don't know. Um, the important part is it's meant to be random. It's meant to be random. These goats were supposed to look the same. In fact, there's some Jewish traditions that say they have to look identical. The goats have to be indistinguishable from each other. Um, that's tradition, of course, not scripture, but interesting. I think the idea is because it doesn't matter. Because the, both these goats are representing Christ ultimately. One of them is going to do one thing. The other is doing something else. And they both, re they both represent something Jesus did for us when he dies on the cross for our sins. Interesting. Now, there's a tradition... There's a Jewish tradition in the Talmud that, that says that if the, the lots, when they cast lots, if the goat that was going to be for the Lord to be offered to God, if that fell in the right hand, the goat on the right side, it was considered like a good sign. Like God's favor is with us. The goat on the right side of the thing that got the, the lot. So that was considered a good sign. If it fell in the left hand, it was not such a good sign. Come, we'll come back to that a little bit later. It's an interesting thing that they have. Um, one of them is going to die and the other is going to be sent away. One will be offered and its blood will be sent for atonement. The other one will be sent out into the wilderness. And we'll get into the details here in verse 11. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself. This is, this, this is for himself. And shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. He shall take a censer. That's going to carry the, um, the, um, something to burn the incense in. He shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar, that is from the bronze altar where the offerings are made. He takes coals from there. I, I think there's some poetic stuff going on here. When offerings are made and their blood drips down upon these coals, and these are the coals you use to burn the incense, which, which represents prayer. So like I even, I even pray in Jesus' name. I even pray through the sacrifice he made, I can come and have my prayers acceptable to God. So he takes a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small and he shall bring it into the, in, inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. So this is something that we often don't notice or realize as we're reading. The, the incense was not only going to create a nice odor, it was going to create a cloud, a smoky cloud. He had to do this, two handfuls of this stuff, put it on the coals to create a lot of smoke because God was going to appear and there needed to be something, even as Aaron's right there in the Holy of Holies, something still between you and God, Aaron. That's the purpose of clouds. When God appears in a cloud, it's not to reveal himself. It's to obscure himself from being fully revealed lest you die. So that's even the incense. It goes there and it's, it goes up and the smoke of the incense, then he appears. And he goes, if you don't do that, bad things will happen. So that's really interesting. Incense, according to scripture, represents prayer and intercession. In Psalm 141, verse 2, it says, let, my, let our prayers rise up to you, Lord, like incense. In Revelation 5, 8, we read that the, there's a, this, this, this vision of heaven where incense is the prayers of the saints rising up before God. So I think here that Jesus' intercession is needed for us to come into God's presence. That's the picture that we're having here, his constant intercession. And when we read in Hebrews, I've said this before, but when we read about how Jesus constantly lives, always lives to intercede for us, I don't necessarily think it means Jesus is praying for you, like 
Father, please take care of them. Please bless them. I don't think that's the picture. I think the picture is he's interceding for us. He's living to intercede for us or make the path for me to have access to God. He's the mediator. He's always living to constantly bring me to God. Every time I pray and think I'm not worthy, I, I realize, no, no, I come through Christ who is worthy so I can pray openly. All right, verse 14. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull, this is for his sin again, and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side, and in the front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. There's that number seven, representing completion, fullness, you know, seven days in a week, that kind of thing. And so he just sprinkles it. A lot of images of the tabernacle have people like throwing buckets of blood around and stuff like that. It's not the idea. No, no, it was just sprinkled because it's symbolic, because it's representative. Verse 14 um, oh, excuse me, verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat for the sin offering. Now the goat is for the people. That is for the people. And bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. So first he offers for himself. He actually enters the Holy of Holies two times on that one day. He only enters once a year, one day, but it's two times on that day. Once for his own sins, then he comes out. Now he offers the bull. Then he comes back in and he offers for the people. Why, does he, why, why doesn't he just offer once for his sins and the people? I think this picture's Christ. He offers for his own sins so that as he comes back, he is a sinless man offering sacrifice for all the people. And that picture's Christ. So he goes in twice that day. The word sprinkle is really significant in the law. We often miss it. If you're reading through, say, the prophets, and you might see the word sprinkle, and it doesn't, you don't think of, I mean, if, if someone were to sprinkle me, I would be highly offended probably, depending on whatever they were doing, I don't know. But this would bother me, I imagine. But actually, in scripture, the term sprinkle is referencing sacrifice and offering and blood covering you. So, we, we read about it here. He sprinkles their blood, the blood of the, uh, of, of the bull and the, the blood of the goat. Well, in 1 Peter 1, 2, it says that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. You see that the New Testament is telling you the fulfillment of the sprinkling is, is Jesus' blood. In Hebrews 10, 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, how could he enter? He could only enter the holy places because he brought blood for atonement. We can enter the holy places. What are we saying? I can come into God's very presence by the blood of Jesus Christ because of his work for me, not because of my holiness, but because of the forgiveness that he's given. And then that passage I keep quoting to you, Isaiah 52 and 53, it has this phrase about the suffering servant. It says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. This passage about how Christ will die on the cross for us and what it means it says that his blood will sprinkle many nations. Even on the Day of Atonement, did that sprinkle many nations? Just Israel. Jesus came. He did more. He did bigger and better than the law ever had done, but he did what the law had always pictured him doing. Beautiful stuff. So remember, all this stuff's representative. The high priest himself represents Christ. The presentation of the blood represents Christ. The, the tabernacle it represents Christ's body. The mercy seat, it has the Ten Commandments of Israel, uh, of, of Moses, right? The things that condemn us, right? It has the manna representing his pure life that saves us. Jesus said, I am the, the true manna. Uh, it has the, the Aaron's rod that budded and that rod that seems to represent death and resurrection. And interestingly, all three of these things also represent rebellion from Israel. When they brought the Ten Commandments, they had already built that golden calf, and Aaron, uh, Moses threw it down, and they broke. When, uh, when the manna came, came when they were complaining and griping and saying, God, you brought us out here to kill us, you know, and God provided for them, and then they even complained about the manna. The rod that budded, the reason that this happened is because of the rebellion of Korah when they said, we don't need Aaron, we don't need God's selected high priest, we'll raise up some other leaders to, be, to do what we want them to do. And Aaron, representing Christ... It's like the Jewish people saying, we can have a different path instead of this Messiah. And, um, and so these things all represent those things. But what do they do? They, they put them inside there, all the rebellion of Israel, covered by mercy, sprinkled with blood, that God might dwell with them. Beautiful stuff. All right, verse 16. It gets even better. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting, 
from the time that he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. So he has to do this completely alone. Like you can't, I don't care what your purpose is, you can't be in there. He goes in alone. Why do you think that is? Because Jesus alone purchases our salvation. He does this atoning thing by himself for all of us. Verse um, 18 Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Interesting side note. When when people were in danger of their lives, they would run and they would grab hold of the horns of the altar. This is where blood was applied. So they were kind of appealing to the mercy that was purchased by these animals, symbolically, and saying, oh, have mercy, have mercy. There were some conditions where they would allow a man to to be... basically protected as he held hold of the horns of the altar. There's other times where they would just drag him kicking and screaming away and be like, no, no, no. Everybody says mercy when they're caught. You know, <laughs> sometimes they, they, they just got him. Verse 19, and he shall sprinkle, there is sprinkle again, some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. So verses 16 through 19 picture the cleaning of the tabernacle, not just the people. The tabernacle itself has to be cleansed. And I think here, everything must be cleansed. All creation has to be redeemed. And so that's the goat that is sacrificed, representing Christ and his cleansing of us, of all, of, of, of making a way to God, access to God, takes it to the next level, of course. Now we get into the procedure with the live goat. And this is the thing that always gets people. You're like, this, what is this? what's up with the scapegoat? What is going on? Verse 20, and when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And here's the procedure for the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat. So he's like transferring their sins onto this animal and um, and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. Someone had to be prepared to like take this goat away. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat free in the wilderness. This is actually similar to a procedure for leprosy, where if the, if the leper had been poor um, and he couldn't afford the normal sacrifices, he'd bring two birds. One bird was killed, and the other bird was dipped in the blood of the killed bird, and then it was set free, and it would just fly away. And the idea is that his, it's taken away. The sin's taken away. That's the idea here. It seems to me pretty obvious. The, the sin is taken away. The scapegoat is about sins being taken far away from the people. He places their sins on to the animal. And this is the new idea in Leviticus, the idea of confession. We've had lots of sacrifices discussed. But this idea for the feasts of Israel, specifically, confession is a new idea for the feasts. Remember, this day of atonement is supposed to be a day of self-affliction and humility. Now combine it with the fact that he's supposed to confess the sins of Israel out loud over this goat. But confession is not enough. A lot of the world thinks it is. You don't just confess. You need, you need this sin to go somewhere, on to someone who will take it away. And that's what this scapegoat does. He puts both his hands. Now every other time... In the book of Leviticus, when we have a sacrifice mentioned, and it talks about placing their hand, we talked about laying hands on the animal, it's always one hand. In Leviticus 1, 4, 3, 2, uh, 3, 8, 3, 13. In chapter 4, verses 4, 24, 29, and 33, they all talk about laying hands on these animals, but it's always one hand. But the Day of Atonement, he laid both hands. Why? Because it's more intense. Okay, look, this is, I'm confessing all the sins of the entire nation upon you. This might take a while. Stick around, you know, and he does this. It seems very clear. He's putting the sins of the people on the goat. Why? To bear them. This goat will bear the sins of the people. And you might be like, how does a goat bear the sins of the people? And I'll say, because it's just picturing Jesus who bears the sins of all people. Isaiah 53, that same passage we keep going to, verse 6, It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah is grabbing the symbolism of the feasts and the sacrifices and applying them to the suffering servant, the Messiah. So our sins are laid upon him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for our sake he made him who knew uh, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
this it always shocks me when I think about the description. Jesus was made to be sin. Just like the scapegoat is. You think anybody wanted to touch this goat? Get it out of here. Get it far away. Let us never see it again. Now, later on in Jewish tradition, what they would do is they would actually take the goat and lest it wander back into town, they would take this goat and push it off a cliff once they got it out of town. Because they're like, we just want to make sure it doesn't come back. This is why the goat sent out. The goat is carrying their sins away from the people. This is not the same as like the burnt offerings. Uh, or I'm sorry, it's the burnt offerings were, were taken, the, the carcass of the animals was taken and burned outside the camp. And that picture is used in Hebrews 13, let us go to him therefore outside the camp. I don't think this is the same as that. I don't think it's just saying, let's go to Jesus who's outside the camp. This is more than that, right? The sins of the people are all upon this goat and it was sent off to never be seen again. Why? Because Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. This is what Jesus did, does for us. Pictured here hundreds of years before Christ did it. Partially, just so the skeptics out there will realize that God had this plan all along, and this is not some new thing. But in 1 John 3, 5, it says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. See, God made him to be sin who knew no sin. So he would take away sins, and now in him there is no sin. He took them away, he buried them, they're gone. Now there's a tradition, another tradition. I think these traditions are interesting. I don't put too much stock in them, but I think they're interesting to hear about. There's another tradition that they would take a scarlet uh, cloth and they would tie it to the goat. I've heard some people say they would tear it in half and they'd put half the cloth up on the door of the temple and the other half on the goat. Um, they would drive the goat out and then miraculously, at least sometimes, this scarlet would turn white and it would symbolize, this is Jewish tradition, this is not Christian stuff we're making up here, right? This is Jewish traditions. And then it would turn white and this was a symbol of God's acceptance of the sacrifice. Ah, though our sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's the idea. Um, so verse 23, as we read on here in Leviticus, it says, Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there, change his clothes, and he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. So, um, so he's, he's one man, one like holy man, so to speak, interceding on behalf of the people. He goes through this glorious change. He puts on his normal garments after the sacrifices. And now he's got the glorious attire. We already talked about this, right? So he looks glorious now, just as Jesus took up his glory after his resurrection. And um, then he offers the burnt offering. And it's, of course, now our job to say, Lord, now I'm fully yours. I'm, I'm a living sacrifice, Romans 12 says. So now we can be presented to him. First Timothy 2.5 pictures this. It says, um, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. By the way, first person in history that I'm aware of to be called the man. 1 Timothy 2.5. Okay, probably not, but I just, like, I just wanted to say it. All right, verse 26. And he who let the goat go to Azazel, or the scapegoat, shall wash his clothes, bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. And the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire. So that's the Hebrews 13. Let's go to him outside the camp. Though he may be rejected, uh, he was as well. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward may come into the camp. So everyone's cleansed. That's the idea. Everybody's cleansed. Even those who took part in the killing or the taking away or the destruction of the sacrificial animals. And I think that's important to realize. I, I, these arguments about who killed Jesus, it just doesn't make any sense. It, it's like Jesus died for the people who killed him. So what does it matter? It's like this is, this is for them. Even those participating in the sacrifices were washed and cleansed. And that's the idea. That's what God's heart is and desire is. Um, there's another uh, tradition. And another tradition that happened during this time is that they would, during this feast, is they would, they would light the, the lampstand inside the temple and they would light it from, uh, from west to east. And it said that it was a sign of God's favor that the, the first candle lit would be the one that would continually burn longer than the others, even though they had the same amount of oil. So they would light it from west to 
to east, and it would stay lit longer. So they had these three signs that they, in tradition, looked at. They had the scarlet, they had the, the, the lamp being lit, and they had the, um, what was the other one I mentioned? The, oh yeah, the, the goat for the Lord being in the right hand. The, the lot for the Lord being falling into the right hand. So these were seen as signs of God's favor. Remember that, we'll come back to it in about two minutes here. We'll talk about it some more. But let's finish reading through here in Leviticus, verse 29. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. Beautiful. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement, wearing the holy linen garments. And he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute for you forever. That atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And, as, and Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. So even though there was a lot of sacrifices and a lot of offerings to God at the temple, there was this concept of a once-for-all atonement. Once-for-all, once-for-all, once-for-all. And it was embedded into Israel so that Christ could explain this to us. Now, here's an interesting thing from the Talmud. You guys know what the Talmud is? The Talmud is the, what they would consider the oral law. Um, so there's the written law the law of Moses. Some more old school Jewish thought is that, that some oral traditions were given to Moses and handed down, never written down, handed down orally and finally written down in the Talmud. Now, this is most certainly not the case. The Talmud literally carries, it has rabbis debating each other who are rabbis that were long after Moses. And it'll be like, Rabbi so-and-so said, Rabbi so-and-so said. And literally, they're debating each other. But it has these interesting tidbits you can find if you're reading through the Talmud, which you may find yourself doing on a random day. I don't know. But in the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, in Yoma 39b, Y-O-M-A 39b, if you want to look it up, you can. It says this about the Day of Atonement. And it says this about the Day of Atonement from the time 30 A.D. until 70 A.D. What happened in 70 A.D.? Temple was destroyed. So the 40 years before the temple was destroyed, there's something written in the Talmud about those events. Obviously, this was not something God gave to Moses. It was in 70 AD. So it says, but during the 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, the lot for God did not arise in the high priest's right hand at all. It was in the left hand for 40 years in a row, according to the Talmud. So too, the strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel did not turn white for 40 years. And the westernmost lamp of the candelabra did not burn continually. According to the Talmud, for 40 years, there were outward signs of God's displeasure with the people of Israel. And there was some indication that this day of atonement sacrifice was not being received anymore. From when? From the year of Jesus' death. I know this sounds weird, but this is in the Talmud. I literally read a, a rabbi trying to explain this. He's like, this isn't telling you guys Jesus is the Messiah. And so he wrote, a, he wrote a whole thing on it, and he's like, it's not that. And when I was like, well, well, how does he explain it then? And the truth is, he doesn't explain it. He just says it's not about Jesus, whatever it is, you know. And I think this is remarkable. I don't know about the factual historical nature of it or not. I just know that in the Talmud, and what's considered to be the highest authoritative source next to the Torah, it says here that for 40 years, God's displeased with the sacrifices offered in the temple. And I think I know why. I think it's because the sacrifice had already been made. The thing that that symbolized was done in Christ, in Messiah, when he did what Isaiah 53 prophesied ahead of time. Does the Day of Atonement point to Jesus? Oh, yeah. Strongly and loudly and clearly. Um, sadly, modern Jews today, they offer, they offer works instead. There's no sacrifice in the Day of Atonement. There are, there's a small group of Jewish men who will offer a chicken. They have a whole procedure they do with, with a chicken uh, offering on the Day of Atonement. But there's but the larger group, they just offer works. They just say, I'll just be a good person. So, you know, that's during this 10 days, from the Feast of Trumpets to the Day of Atonement, there's like a time of people trying to do good deeds to commend themselves to God. But that's not what the Day of Atonement's about, is it? It's about substitutionary atonement. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, the final feast is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus 23, 
verse 33. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel on the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. So it's a week-long celebration, and it happens right after the Day of Atonement. Well, shortly thereafter, not immediately, but shortly thereafter. It's going to happen starting on the 15th day, not the 10th day. That's the Day of Atonement. Not the first day. That's the Feast of Trumpets, but the 15th. Verse 35 says, On the first day, that's the first day of the feast, shall be a holy convocation, and you shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day, you shall hold a a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord, on the fifteenth day... Of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the, uh, the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. So this is another harvest-related feast. There's different types of crops are harvested at different times. So we had the wheat harvest, the barley harvest. We dealt with those. This is the grape harvest and some other things. I, I can't remember now off the top of my head. I should have wrote it down. There's specific things that are harvested during this time, and they bring them all in. Um, and then verse uh, 40 Um, And you shall take on the first day of the fruit of splendid trees, branches, palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. That's like tents. You'll be in a tent for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. So this is another one of the feasts, like Passover, right? Like Pentecost, Feast of Booths is a gathering feast. You have to gather to Jerusalem from wherever you are. They gather together and they dwell in booths. Even today, Jews will observe this. They'll set up tents in their backyard if, if they don't go to Israel or Jerusalem for it. They'll set up a tent. They'll set up things like that. And uh, the Feast of Booths is still observed to this day. The booths might remind them, and it might an- cause them to anticipate something, I think. Well, we'll t- I'll talk about that in a little bit, the, the, um, yeah, the prophetic stuff, because it's a whole other can of worms to talk about that. But um, what we get in the Feast of Booths is this memorial to how when Israel came out of Egypt, they lived in tents for 40 years. And then we're brought into the, into the promised land. So this temporary sort of, we're roaming, we're trusting in God, God's providing for us. And he goes, I want you to remember that. Jesus, he connects to the Feast of Booths a couple times in the scripture. One is um, in John 1, 14, where it says Jesus tabernacled amongst us. That's the same word there for the booths, the Feast of Booths. He tabernacled amongst us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 calls us to be in tents, so to speak. It says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. In fact, this is the theme. This is the theme in First Peter. It's the theme of being pilgrims passing through. We're sojourners. So we're kind of like in a constant sojourn. Paul talks about this as his tent. This is when I give up this tent, this earthly tent, you know, I'm going to exchange it for something greater. Now there's more New Testament light on this in John chapter 7 and 8, because the events of John 7 and 8 happen at the Feast of Booths. That happened during this specific feast. And what Jesus says connects to things they did during this feast. It was considered a great celebration. They would would do uh, torch juggling. Like this is in the literature. (laughs) They would actually do torch juggling. And they they had these big pillars where they would light these massive bowls full of oil. Just (laughs) big flames. That supposedly there were so many torches during the Feast of Booze that they said you could see it in Galilee which you probably couldn't, they were probably exaggerating, but, <laughs> but, uh, but the idea is obviously it was incredibly well lit, this whole thing. And there'd be the people of Israel just kind of dotted all over the, the, the hillside near Jerusalem in these booths, just having a good old time. The, uh, the priests were incredibly busy because they not only did the sacrifices, they would do things to entertain the people, dancing, 
right? And blowing the trumpets again as usual. And then of course, d juggling fire and things like this. So it was a really busy time. There's actually one ancient priest who's, or ancient rabbi, excuse me, uh, who, who said that they, uh, they didn't even get to sleep because they were just so busy, um, which that's too bad. It's fun for everybody else but you, <laughs> I guess. Um, so it's considered a big deal. Also, there was a water libation ceremony. And the water libation ceremony, you could look up the term and you could read about it if you'd like. But they would actually have a ceremony. They'd bring water up um, from the Pool of Siloam. I think it was the Pool of Siloam. Um, and they bring it up and they pour it there at the temple. They pour it out. And the idea is that God is providing water for us. It's in memory of how he provided water in the wilderness when they were encamped. And it would be speaking of the living water that would spring forth. And so... Um, in Isaiah, we read about that. Well, it was at this feast in John 7, it says now the, in John 7 too, now the, now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So it's very clear what feast is going on in John 7. And then in John 7, 37, it says on the last day of the feast, the great day, the, the big culmination of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What was going on? The water libation ceremony. The idea that God's providing, he's going to provide this living water. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Here we have Jesus himself at a feast, pointing to the feast to point to him. Now I told you about the lights from the torches, and the lights from the booze and the juggling of torches and the big, big pillars with the oil lamps that were on them. In John 8, 12, at this same feast, it says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Why is Jesus saying this? He's trying to not only tell you who he is and what he will give you, but he's trying to say, look, I am, everything you're doing, it's about me. Like when he said, Moses wrote of me. If you believed him, you'd believe me. I think that's kind of neat. <laughs> this is kind of neat stuff. From the, from the, the trumpets, um, which I admittedly is still somewhat of a mystery, right? In some, in some respects. To the Day of Atonement, to the Feast of Booze, we see these things pointing to Jesus Christ. Now, Numbers 29 it records a bunch of different offerings done on this day, and it's something of a countdown. Um, there's several different animals offered, but on the first day, 13 bulls are offered. On the second day, 12 bulls. On the third day, 11 bulls. So it's like 13, 12, 11, 10. It keeps going down. On the, on the final day, the eighth day, one bull was offered. So there's like this countdown going on at the Feast of Booths. That would be the day, when the last great day, when Jesus stood up and he made those proclamations. Um, that's interesting. Um, and perhaps we'll get more clarity on this in the future. But now what I want to do is just for a couple minutes, talk to you about some total conjecture that people offer. Because here's the thing. Jesus fulfilled Passover on the day of Passover. He filled, fulfilled unleavened bread during the, during the week of unleavened bread. He fulfilled first fruits on first fruits he rose from the dead. Pentecost happened when? On Pentecost, right? The giving of the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of natural for us to think, is there a future year? where all of these, the, the trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booze, like where these are going to be fulfilled to the, on the day? Now, it could be. Do we have a guarantee that that's the case? No. I mean, God can do whatever he wants. We don't have to be like, well, you did this before. You have to do it again the same way. I can't do that to him, like, right? He can do whatever he wants. But this creates a lot of conjecture. And a lot of, and I don't usually get involved in a lot of the, like, People telling you like, oh, there's blood moons and there's, this is going to happen next year. And oh, it's coming up. Israel's 70th year. And that means I'm like, I just change the channel whenever I see that kind of stuff. Like I'm not interested. I have never seen godly men make a bigger fool of themselves when they, than when they try to predict the future. I've never seen it except then. And so I don't want to fall into that trap. Um, so, but I, but I will just offer you some of the things people think might be related. I'm not, I'm not putting my, my two cents in here. These are things that might be, right? Um, some people think the Feast of Trumpets, it could be a recollection of the trumpet judgments of Revelation calling people to repent. Maybe trumpets calling, it, it could be related to those trumpets of judgment. Maybe there's a particular particular trumpet that happens on one of the days. Some people think the Feast of Trumpets is the rapture and that, that we're, boom, we're out of here, right? And then there's these like, you know, 10 days before the Day of Atonement. That, that, that's another people thing some people think. Um, others would say that Feast of Trumpets may signal a time of God regathering Israel because that's kind of what it was doing. After the Feast of Trumpets, people are gathering, gathering for the Feast of Booze. So it's gathering Israel together. 
I have no idea. Um, there's a lot of trumpet passages in the Bible you can go to. You can pick one to, to fit whatever your theory is, pretty much. You really can. So in Matthew, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, Revelation, there's lots of trumpet passages. I don't know how to put all that together myself. Um, I think it's interesting. Um, the Day of Atonement, some people see the Day of Atonement as the second coming of, of Christ. That he actually comes on the Day of Atonement. Except that no man knows the day or the hour, and so I'm not, I don't know about that, you know? But it's possible that Christ actually shows up on the Day of Atonement, and as they saw the high priest, you know, reveal himself and do all these things, that that's when Israel goes like, whoa, Jesus, he's the one. That's possible. Um, it might just be that the Day of Atonement is a time where Israel just recognizes Jesus for who he is, because it's a time, in fact, it's the only time of national repentance and turning to God for, the, for Israel as a whole, as a nation. So maybe the Day of Atonement has something to do with Israel, boom, revival in Israel, a bunch of Jewish people coming to Christ, coming to Messiah, and, and experiencing the fullness of what God has for them. Also, the Day of Atonement, interestingly enough, while the Feast of Trumpets signals the civil new year, the Day of Atonement would be the day that would trigger the Jubilee. The Jubilee was once every 50 years, and it was when, if you owned, if you were, you were, I'm a Jew and I own land in Israel, guess what? My land comes back to me on that day. If I'd sold it or loaned it out, it comes back to me on that day. The, the people go free and the land is restored. So maybe the Day of Atonement has something connected to the Israel entering their inheritance. I have no idea. <laughs> maybe. Um, uh, so that, that could be the case. And the Feast of Tabernacles, um, it could be that this whole tabernacling thing, Israel goes back into tents. Well, in Revelation, we read about, if, it's, if you have a futurist view, which I do take a futurist view, and most of you guys do too, I think. If you have that view, then we see that Israel actually is attacked by Satan during the tribulation, and they leave Israel, and they hide in the wilderness, and they're protected. So they're actually tabernacling again. And so the Feast of Tabernacles could be prophetic about a future time when they'll tabernacle, except they seem to tabernacle for more than just a week. So I don't know how to make that exactly seven days. Um, you know, um, Could be, could be the case. It could be that it talks about them... Um, going back into the land, entering into the millennium. Oh, it's, it's you're inheriting the land, just like tabernacling somehow represents inheriting the land. I don't know. I really don't know. But I have one theory. That is that in a little while, I may be able to explain this better. <laughs> you just have to wait long enough, however long that takes. Because I would not have been able to predict, based on the feasts, what Jesus would have done during Passion Week. And I don't know now how to predict based on the feast, what Jesus or might happen, you know, at some future time. I don't know how to predict that. And I think that we can be a little reckless sometimes. And I'm speaking of pastors here. We can be a little reckless sometimes because we just like something that we start sharing it and we kind of hijack scripture to, to back it up. But in the first feast, I'll say this. We have a nation being purchased by God. Passover, first fruits, unleavened bread, Pentecost. We have a nation being purchased by God and brought out. In the last feast, we have a nation being brought back to God, right? The birth of a nation and then the saving of a nation. That's what we have in these two different sets of feasts. They hear the call of God, the Feast of Trumpets. They see the sacrifice for what it is. They travel with God to enter the inheritance that God has for them. And so I do hope that it's related to a revival for the Jewish people. I'm very excited to see that happen. Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, so I hope this has been a blessing to you guys. I'll, we'll do, we'll do Q&A, but first let's pray. And um, uh, just thank God for uh, how neat the scripture is. Yeah. Um, Lord, we thank you for this. It's exciting. Um, we, we get to look back and see the completed work of the scriptures and the word of God and find the connections between old and new and these intricate, detailed things that are like the fingerprint of God upon the scriptures and upon the lives of people and the nation of Israel. And so we are grateful. Jesus... However, these things are to be fulfilled um, in whatever capacity or way. We're just excited to see it. We're excited to know about it. We're excited, Lord, for what you've already done. We recognize Jesus as the one sacrifice who has taken our sins away as far as the east is from the west. We recognize and we're so grateful, Lord. And just like that day of atonement led into a time of rejoicing, we want to be in a time of rejoicing, knowing the forgiveness we have in Christ, May we be a joyful people. May we be excited because we know what you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>